Hi, and welcome to this latest immigration law conversation. Today, I'm joined by Colin Yeo, who's a barrister and the editor of the well-known free movement immigration law website. And he's here to talk about his new book, Welcome to Britain, about fixing our broken immigration system. So Colin, thank you so much for joining me on a very hot summer's day uh, today during lockdown. Um, perhaps I'm sure most of our audience know you already, but perhaps tell us a bit about you and what you do. Yeah, well, I first of all, if there are beads of sweat on my forehead, hopefully it is because of the temperature rather than because of your, your interrogation and no, questions. No Paxman questions today, so we're all right. Um, so, and you've already introduced me. I'm, um, yeah, I'm barrister. I practice from Garden Court Chambers. Um, I've been doing immigration law for, for 20 years now. And um, as you say, I, I edit the Free Movement website, which is a sort of immigration updates and law um, um, service that a lot, of, a lot of lawyers read these days. And what led you to write the new book? I suppose you're already maintaining the website, you're running a practice as a barrister. Why write a book on fixing our broken immigration system? Well, I didn't have enough to do already, you know. Um, no, I, I kind of, I was, I was fed up of just complaining about things. It's very easy to um, complain about our immigration system. There's so much wrong with it. You know, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a really awful system. Um, I wanted to to do two things really. One was to try and think a bit more constructively about how it could be reformed. And I'm not, and this is a sort of controversial area, and of course, as soon as you start making positive suggestions, then some people are going to disagree with you. So I'm quite nervous about how the book goes down in our, in our immigration law community. But, um, you know, it's, it's, I think it is useful to be constructive. And I was trying to think of things that could be said that aren't just scrap it all you know not just don't just abolish the immigration system how could you actually make it more positive and welcoming and um, much better for our clients and also put people like you and me out of work a little bit you know and, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah don't take that the wrong way or anything but and, and lots of, we're not unique in that immigration wise mm. lots of us want um, things to be easier for our clients which would have the side effect of, of doing us out of work and a lot of social welfare lawyers are like that you know family lawyers criminal lawyers they don't want there to be family splits they don't want there to be uh, crime on the streets and um, they'd, they'd rather they didn't have quite as much to do but you know, in, in the reality of the situation is that um, we, we, we do have our work cut out for us. The, the other thing that I really wanted to sort of try and do, and I think this was a bit of a luxury, was do a bit of reading around the subject, because I feel like I know quite a lot about how to make immigration applications and how to argue immigration appeals and what the law is, but how the law came to be and a kind of more analysis of, of how it is, how it happened why it is like it is and so on. I, I, I felt I was really a bit lacking in that. So I've been doing quite a lot of reading around as preparation for the book and my kind of way of doing things, and that's why I started the, the website, I suppose, is um, I like to, to write things, but um, to, to sort of understand it. And that involves doing a certain amount of reading to, to, to help with that. And that's, that's really helpful. That was one of the things I wanted to ask you about is how you found the writing process and what you learned. Perhaps you could tell us, you, you alluded to reading around. Often as lawyers, we read case law, we read legislation, we read rules, but what did you, what was your reading and what was your learning in, in, in the process of writing the book? Well, I was looking for some more academic stuff on immigration law and policy. And um, I'm sort of tempted to just go to my bookshelf and show you. I don't think I'll do that, it's not particularly helpful, but um, there's a whole sort of range of different books that I read about um, the way that um, immigration policy had evolved in the UK. I was looking at the way that the system works in the US and the issue of um, undocumented migrants in that country. Um, the idea of citizens in waiting, um, which is one of the sort of themes of, of Welcome to Britain, is, is something that I've picked up from, from other writers. Um, so yeah, it was, it, was, it, was, it was quite interesting. Take a bit of time out really to, to sort of think about things and to, to step back a little bit from day to day practice. Absolutely. Now let's get to the important point, Paddington Bear. You know, one of, one of my favourite uh, pieces on the Free Movement blog was your immigration lawyer's review of both Paddington films. Is Paddington in the new book? And if not, tell us about, well, what would happen to Paddington if he arrived today in the UK in the hostile environment? 
Yeah, Paddington, I, I can show you a picture of the book. Here, look, here's the book. Um, Paddington, does, Paddington does feature. So he's, he's at the start and he's, he's at the end. And, and that's a sort of um, acknowledgement of the fact that the stuff I wrote about the Paddington films is some of the most, their most popular blog posts that I've, I've ever written. Um, and um, I think he's, and he's, he's a real hero, isn't he, for, for immigration lawyers and campaigners. He's such a sort of success story of um, somebody who's welcomed into a family and becomes part of the culture. Um, although I think there's also uh, a note of sadness because he never loses his observer status. And I, I suspect that that's something that a lot of migrants feel when they settle down in a new society. They, they still feel that they're observers and therefore outsiders to some degree no matter how welcomed and integrated they become um, but yeah he, he, he's quite interesting um, because he's, he's well known and in popular culture he's quite a good jumping off point for trying to explain a little bit about how our system works what the criteria are for refugee status and then also um, and, and this is sort of what I've tried to do with the, the review of the second film look at the hostile environment and the way that actually you know he's he's committed a criminal offense on entry he's not allowed to work and it's a sort of famous you know uh, to pull tom conti's hair haircut at the at, at the back and so on. he's working in a barbershop well he's not allowed to do that you know could the browns be in trouble for renting accommodation to him and we never see money change hands there so there's a, a slight bit of license i think with uh, with suggesting that but um yeah it, it's it's an interesting jumping off point for kind of trying to educate people about how the system really works uh, and in terms of you mentioned the hostile environment, what do you think the impact has been in terms of the hostile environment and the associated policies? It's, it's a disaster, um, and I, it's a really, it's a really interesting policy and disastrous policy because it, it seems to me that it acknowledges that there's a large, um, what I call in the book, an unauthorized population. I think I, the, the word illegal is used by people on the right who, who don't like immigrants, generally speaking, sort of illegal immigrants is the, is the terminology, or illegals even worse. Um, a lot of people on, who, who campaign on these issues call them undocumented. As a, you know, this, I, I couldn't get away from being a lawyer. Undocumented doesn't quite sit right for me because that gets to the heart of what happened with the, um, the Windrush scandal. Um, you, you talk about people who were legally resident, but they didn't have documents to prove it. And so undocumented and not lawful aren't, aren't completely overlapping sort of groups. So I use the term unauthorized um, because they don't have a kind of formal authorization to, to be here. And the hostile environment tacitly acknowledges, it seems to me, that that population exists and is going to continue to exist. The overt purpose is to force them to leave, but there's just no evidence that it works. You know, if, if you actually look at the Home Office statistics, the number of enforced removals has been going down year on year since 2010, which a lot of people don't realise. The number of voluntary returns has also been going down as well in recent years. So you know, there's, there's the recent National Audit Office report from just like it was last week, wasn't it, saying that the Home Office just doesn't know whether it works. They don't seem to be interested in commissioning research on it. And it doesn't really seem to be genuinely about forcing people out, which, which I'd object to anyway. I, mean, that's a, it's a, I think that's a bad policy. Um, but it doesn't seem to actually do that. It's just about tolerating them here as a sort of group, but forcing them into this abysmal situation of, of penury where they can be exploited and they've got no route to lawful status. I mean, you know, going putting our immigration lawyer hats on again, you've got the 20-year route as we we call it in truth it's a 30-year route to to settlement it takes you 30 years to get settled that's just ridiculous you know so these people there's a lot of them estimates go as high as 1.2 million and there are disputes about how accurate those figures are but you know that's one reputable estimate um and that they're they're here in our society they live with us they're they're, they're not going anywhere and yet they're totally cut off from the social welfare net and, um, and they have no way of becoming lawful and, and they're mainly black and ethnic minority. And you know, to, to, to tolerate that kind of abysmal inequality in our society just seems really fundamentally wrong to me. No, absolutely. One of the biggest challenges I, I see is when you see families uh, and they just can't afford to make applications and they're making choices between which family members to uh, apply for. So they can't even uh, afford to apply to make themselves lawful. Do you have any comment in terms of how the hostile environment and immigration fees to make applications has gone? 
Yeah, and that's that's part of it. You know, pricing people out of lawful status to which they would otherwise be entitled just seems fundamentally wrong. I mean, what's the rationale for that? It's just bonkers. And what what are they achieving? They're just forcing people into illegality, but not forcing them out of the country. And how can that possibly be sensible public policy? And do you, do you think we've gone through, or we're still going through COVID? We've had the demonstrations with Black Lives Matter. Do you think we'll see these factors will make a change to the hostile environment? I'd like to think so. Um, but, you know, I, I, and, and it does feel like it could be a time for change. There's, there's several things feel like they're coming together. The Black Lives Matter campaign and the momentum behind that, the fact that people do genuinely seem to be thinking about race in a way they just weren't previously, plus the fact that we've just had Brexit, we need a new immigration system of, of, of some sort. We've got um, you know, the simplification project that's been driven by the Law Commission. So there's, there's a few different things that are sort of coming together and clearly there are going to be changes. Um, so it feels like there could be positive changes. Um, you know, the fact, and I, I'm not a big fan of the current government, shall we say, to put it mildly, but the fact that a government has a substantial majority of, of, of 80 does give it a lot of power to, to do things that it wants to, irrespective of its own support. And, um, you know, there the, the could be, the, there is potential for positive change at least. But realistically, I'm, I'm just not sure that the current bunch that we've got in government are, are, are going to be that interested in, in positive change. Um, and they, you know, to be fair to them, they say that they're going to implement all of the Windrush review recommendations um, I, I don't trust them to do that, but that's that's what they're saying. It, you know, it, it could be a time of positive change, but I'm not holding my breath. And, and you said at the start, your book tries to make some positive recommendations. What are sort of your summary of some positive steps we could take, either big picture, macro, or, or micro steps that we could take in trying to fix the system? Well, and on, on a macro level, one of the things that really sort of it wasn't how I started the book. You asked me about the writing process earlier. It was, um, it's a bit of a nightmare because I didn't have a clear um, theme that I was trying to get across at the start. I was just sort of wanted to, to learn. It was a learning project for me. And so I sort of started writing and then found the more that I read and the more that I wrote that themes were emerging. So I then had to go back and rewrite the stuff that I'd already written with that in mind. And then once you've sort of done the contents of the book, then you, you realize that your introduction is rubbish. So you have to rewrite your introduction and doing that makes you realize what you really wanted to say in the first place. So then you have to rewrite all your contents. It's just, you know, it's sort of never ending circle. Um, but one of the big themes that, that emerged is that the um, governments for the last well, since, since the early 90s, really, have followed a policy of deterrence, where they've tried to keep the numbers down um, of migrants coming into the UK by deterring people from coming in the first place by having various different harsh policies. And first of all, you saw this with just um, asylum seekers. So you, you saw the kind of ending of main access to mainstream benefits in the 90s, and you saw various different measures under new labour. Um, none, of, none of that really seem to work, but that didn't stop them from trying again with um, the sort of myth of benefits, tourism and EU citizens, and then with the hostile environment from 2010, 2012 onwards. Um, there's no evidence that any of that works or that it actually puts off other, anybody other than a small handful of elite, really skilled people who have got a choice of what country to go to. You know, but If you're a really well qualified, um, skilled worker of some sort with, with three PhDs behind you, you can choose what country you go to and you might well be influenced by the policies that different countries have. Or if you're an international student with loads of money and you're looking for what university to study at, again, you, you might well be influenced by that country's general treatment of migrants. But for most people, they're just not. And those deterrent policies don't put anybody off. There's no evidence that they put anybody off. But what they do do is punish the migrants who come so the people who come end up being charged these huge immigration fees we were talking about earlier. They're, they're, they're subject to all this discrimination that the hostile environment brings about, the complexities of the system, and just the, the general mean-mindedness that, that permeates our immigration system. Um, and it, it's, it handicaps them. So if you think about a, a family of skilled workers who come under tier two, you know, the, the immigration fees that they have to, to cough up 
obviously it's a disaster if they don't and they become they become unauthorized and often they, they don't leave or some don't leave at least but even if they do find the fees and cough them up then that's a lot of money that that family would otherwise have had that they then don't have and it's just kind of socially and economically punishing migrants basically for coming to the uk that's bound to have an impact on the family and on their children. They can't take holidays. They can't afford the things that another comparable family would do. And that just seems like really bad public policy again. You know, if you're saying to, uh, the, the, word Im the word integration is, is a difficult one because it can be used in a very politically charged way and sort of akin to assimilation. You know, people have to integrate here. It's up to them to integrate. It, you, you could also use it in a more, um, open way where you're talking about a sort of two-way process where they adapt to life here and we also adapt to them and, and, and I think that that can be used in a positive um, way in that sense and to say to migrants you know you need to integrate when you get here or it, it's, 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 it's a good idea for you to integrate when you get here and yet also to be punishing them and handicapping them in this way again it's just nuts that it doesn't make any sense at all. No, fantastic. No, that's really helpful, Colin. Um, in terms of, we're, we're recording this just before the launch of the book. It launches on the 29th of June. Just tell people in terms of how do they get hold of the book and perhaps for those people who are not free movement, how they can subscribe to free movement and what you get from subscribing. Well, you can, um, here you go, here it is. Um, you can order it from, um, from free movement itself. I've got some signed copies that you can, you can order via the website. Um, or you can just get it from Waterstones or, or Amazon or from the publishers bite back. Um, so it, it's sort of, it's, it's freely available. I, I doubt it will be in local bookshops unless people ask for it because it's a, it's a bite back or a pretty small publishers, um, but you can certainly get hold of it easily online. No, that's fantastic, Colin. Thank you so much uh, for coming on today. It's great to talk to you and hopefully this will be something that will you know, get out there to the general public, really raise awareness, but also see momentum for positive change, because I, I think that's something that's come across strongly from what you've said. Well, let's hope so. Colin, thank you very much. I look forward to speaking to you, to, to you soon, probably in person, I hope, rather than socially distanced. Yeah, I look forward to it. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Colin.